In many households throughout America, life is temporarily turned upside down when a family member is born with a disability. But these families quickly realize that many blessings accompany the unexpected. Today, you'll hear the perspective of those with disabilities as well as those who love them. Stay with us. Chip and Donna Hammond are natives of Round Hill, Virginia. They were already parents of three children, Trey, Caitlin, and Nathan, when they welcomed their fourth child, Becca, into the world. Since the time of her birth, Becca's parents suspected something might be different about their daughter. She had problems eating and was a little delayed physically, but they weren't too concerned until she began having seizures at eight months old. We were getting ready to go on a family reunion and uh, I heard Donna yell. She said, uh, Rebecca just had a seizure. We called 911 and she was rushed to the hospital. And, um, and, and that was really the first indication. I mean, it was a very, it, it took, a, it took a, a, quite a long time really to, to realize the extent of, of, the, of the difficulties that she would have. You know, that she has um, structural problems with her brain that causes the seizures and also her other delays. Becca has battled seizure disorders for the past eight years and her development has slowed to a crawl. After much testing, the doctors diagnosed her with cortical dysplasia, which means the entire right side of her brain doesn't function. Becca doesn't speak or respond to directions very well and is cognitively about one year old. But she walks and is very healthy in almost every other way, and she positively impacted the Hammond family and everyone she meets. One of the things when she was younger is that they would talk about her having, you know, they wouldn't say autism, but they would say autistic-like behaviors. She would be very much, you know, kind of in her own world. But as she's gone, gotten older, she's become more cognizant of other people. So she, you know, she'll, she'll, uh, she doesn't show affection in typical ways, but uh, she'll, uh, you know, to her, to her brothers or sisters or to myself or Donna, uh, she'll be running around and then she'll just, uh, you know, run up and lean into you or put her mouth on you or something like that. She does have her kisses. Yeah, yeah. And she has, and she hugs her family members. Yeah. She, she does. And when she, when I'm introducing her to a, to new children who don't know her and could be uncomfortable and not understand why she's not answering their questions or interacting with them the way they'd expect her to, I tell them, you know, I'll ask them, well, how many of you like to wrestle with your dad? And they all raise their hand. I said, well, you know, Rebecca likes to wrestle with her dad and to go with her dad. And how many of you like to go swimming? Oh, I love to go swimming. Well, Rebecca loves to go swimming. And I try to point, you know, she has her joys and her interests just like they do, that she can't communicate what she likes as well. But just like, she's more like them than not like them. She loves to be on the trampoline, she loves to be on the slide or just running around outside. She'll, um, she likes to roll a ball. By, Pretty, her, by yeah, herself. By herself. She likes to roll a ball and chase it. She has different toys that she likes to play with. Um, a bath, a long, long bath. Hour, hour and a half she'll spend, really? as long as the water will stay warm. She, water's her absolute favorite thing. She actually becomes a different child in the water. She, um, yeah, more the, interactive. More right? interactive, better eye contact, more aware. Just the pressure of the water seems to be very um, stabilizing to her nervous system. And she just loves, loves being in the water. Life is different with somebody like Becca. What are the struggles that you face in day-to-day -day life? She has to be watched all the time when she's home. She has really, she's very impulsive, has no real sense of the danger, danger yeah. of things so she has turned on the gas on the stove accidentally if she's gotten in there and so so we have to make sure that someone's always watching her and that um, makes things a little complicated how are you able to communicate with becca say there's a, a moment in life where you need to teach her or instill in her something for her safety or for day-to-day -day life how do you accomplish that task Repetition, repetition. Yeah. <laughs> over and over and over. And something that might take another child a few times takes hundreds and hundreds of times for Rebecca. She understands the word no. And yeah. so that's our go-to word when we need her to stop 
or to pay attention, um, no. Well, usually she'll stop and look at us if we say no. Yeah, and she's not a, um, I don't know how to put it, she's not, uh, you know, she doesn't have a, uh, you know, any kind of a malicious spirit. She's very, she's a very kind of an, you know, easy, compliant child with what she's capable of doing. How do her brothers and sister interact with her? I mean, you know, f phenomenally well, and that was, as, as it became clearer what, that there was something wrong with Rebecca that was going to uh, impact the family, I was concerned that the other children may be resentful, you know, when they were young. But that's not been the case at all. They're uh, extremely protective of her, extremely uh, um, affectionate toward her. You know, I'd have to say, uh, Brad, that it's, it's had a kind of an amazing effect in that, uh, in that, um, uh, you know, when our kids say go to the grocery store and there'll be like maybe uh, somebody working as a bagger with Down syndrome and, uh, you know, other people may be uncomfortable with that. My, my kids aren't at all uncomfortable with people who are, you know, who may have cognitive disabilities. So would you say your kids have been affected in a positive way as a result of Becca being in the family? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And we have friends who will say, your children are so compassionate beyond their years, um, are patient, are um, tender-hearted. And so it's, it's nice to hear from other people that, that they've noticed those things that we've seen in our children. When we return, we'll meet a man who's overcoming a muscle disability to bring beautiful art to his community. Look around you. We're surrounded by people who courageously face difficult obstacles life has thrown in their paths. Tune in each week to meet people who show there are positive, godly solutions to tough, critical situations. This Emmy Award-winning show tackles challenging life issues such as abortion, stem cell research, and adoption, and shows every human life is valuable and precious. Join us for inspiring stories of people facing life head on. John Siebold is a retired mechanical engineer from Frankfort, Kentucky. All his life, he suspected there might be something different about him. As a kid, he had trouble keeping up with friends, tired easily, and couldn't jump very high. But it wasn't until he was 55 years old that he was finally diagnosed with muscular dystrophy. To cope with his illness, John took up painting as a creative and cathartic outlet. John, what is muscular dystrophy and when were you first diagnosed with it? Muscular dystrophy is a degeneration of the muscles in your body. I don't have it as bad as Jerry Lewis's kids do. My muscles degenerate at a very slow rate. I have what they call limp girdle muscular dystrophy. So is the reality that you're slowly losing control of mm. your muscles? They're getting weak, not losing control. They're getting weak. And from the weakness, I can't like hold my hand up as long as you can, or raise my hand, arms up for a long period of time. And my legs will tire out very quickly when I'm walking. And my back, the back is really more the problem than anything else, it gets weak. And I'll have to sit down and I'll have to rest. And after resting for a while, I can get up and go do it, go move around again. So these are symptoms you've had most of your life? I've had most of my life. I just never realized that they were something unusual. John, how long have you been painting? I've been only painting for about, uh, oh, let's say 10 years. When did you start painting? I started painting when I got down in Kentucky. I took classes at, at KSU, <clears throat> and I, that's where it started and I dealt with acrylics and then eventually went to oil. But <clears throat> ever since I was a kid, I was drawing pictures. And I even taken some classes in, uh, in drawing. And I always got compliments on my work. I never, people never said, well, you gotta really look at that. I always got compliments initially. Even this painting behind here, it was painted to represent a photograph. That's the first one I did. The very first one, one. The very first one I did with that. Can you walk me through the painting process? What motivates you? What, what moves you to complete a particular project? 
I have to see something unique. I have to see, um, well, like this painting. This is a good example. A dog's in a bunch of bushes. How many times do you see a dog in a bushes looking like this? That's unique. And with the buffalo, the initial position of this buffalo was unique. He wasn't a buffalo running down the, the field or standing on the side. He was, he initially come from a, a picture where he was frozen practically. When you see him, you think he was all frozen, but he wasn't, he was alive. That's the way they live. I mean, they can take the ice. So that's the way it attracted me. Um, and that's usually what every one of the paintings, that's what will attract me to want to paint. I want to redo that and put my own little touch on it. Are there other things you do differently because of the muscular dystrophy? Now, I won't put the painting up on an easel like some instructors want me to do. I will have it laying down. I have to be sitting down. I can't stand up. That would be the other thing. John, has your disability in any way detracted from your quality of life? that I would work to prevent that from happening. I will do whatever it takes to get that done. And any other projects around the house, they take longer, but they get done. I will not let that, I will not let that stop me. In a moment, we'll meet an amazing young man who doesn't let cerebral palsy stop him from making a difference on Capitol Hill. Whether you're a student needing answers, a parent needing help, or a concerned citizen wanting to make a difference, Life Issues Institute has the resources you need to put your values into action. Life Issues Institute is an international educational organization committed to protecting innocent human life. Life Issues Institute knows what it takes. That's why millions throughout the world turn here for help. Life Issues Institute has authored more pro-life publications than any other entity in the world, and its materials are printed in over 30 languages. Radio broadcasts, newsletters, and a website filled to the brim with the answers you're looking for are just a click away. Go to FacingLife.tv and click on the link to Life Issues Institute to find out more about how you can change the heart of a nation. Aaron Welty is a native of Southeast Michigan who was born 10 weeks premature and diagnosed with cerebral palsy. His mother and father made the decision to treat him as a normal kid, to challenge Aaron instead of coddling him. As a result of his upbringing, Aaron was determined to do his best to make a difference. When only 13 years old, Aaron knew he wanted to work on Capitol Hill with Congress. For the past five years, he's been working as a legislative assistant to Representative Thaddeus McCotter. Aaron hopes to continue working to bring attention to many important issues. When I was born um, at uh, 30 weeks, I was severely underdeveloped and there were some issues with like blood and fluid on the brain. And when that happens, um, one of two things will generally occur. Either the, the cranial cavity will grow larger to accommodate the extra material that's there, or the pressure will take part of the brain and, and crush it and render it inoperable. And the second thing, the, the crushing of part of the brain and rendering it inoperable, is what happened to me. Um, and uh, as a result of that and some other things that happened really early on, um, I, I came to understand that I have cerebral palsy. And again, my understanding is that once you have it, you have it. As you grow up and you get older, um, it's, it's kind of like arthritis, I guess. The, the things just get difficult and the weather starts to affect things and you have to deal with a lot of pain. And uh, you know, so I've just, kind of, I've just kind of dealt with that and you know, I do what I have to do and then I decided to come here and be in this environment on top of all that, so. But it's more, it's a physical disability and not a mental disability, correct? Um, well, it can be both. In my case, it's more physical. For example, when I was born, the doctor said, you know, 
he'll never walk, he'll um, be severely mentally impaired, he'll always be a burden to those around him and those taking care of him, and he'll never really accomplish much in his life. Well, that was a pretty um, picture, wasn't it? No, no, and, and, and you know, I'm very fortunate that uh, my mom and my dad and my grandma kind of looked at the doctors and said, well, we don't believe you, and, and we're gonna see what happens. Aaron, tell me a little bit about your boss briefly and what it is that you do for him. Okay, my, uh, the congressman that I work for is Thaddeus McCotter from Michigan's 11th district. It's um, Southeast Michigan outside of Detroit. From a young age, about 13 years old, I knew that I wanted to come to Washington, D.C. and to work in Congress. I began to realize around that time that I was born in America. I could have been born somewhere else in the early 80s uh, where I would not necessarily have been safe and my life wouldn't have been as secure as it is. And so I had to find a way to kind of give back. You know, friends of mine had suggested, why don't you go to Washington? And I kind of grabbed that idea and, and ran with it. Here we are. It's tougher than, than people think, and I, I, I work on a, a portfolio of about a dozen different issues, and among those, you know, religious freedom and the pro-life issue and family issues and education. And, you know, I, I really do enjoy working on the pro-life issue, partially because of my own story that we're telling today um, and the fact that I'm still here when I should not be. One of the greatest concerns Aaron faced when coming to Washington, D.C. was how he'd get around the city. Fortunately, his dad came up with a creative means of transportation in which Aaron could navigate the city. He's even been contacted by NASA with questions about his unusual vehicle. Aaron, tell me about the Phoenix Project, version 4.2 now. Oh gosh, I love the Phoenix Project. That came out of um, just my need to be able to safely get around the different places that I was at. Um, the current iteration, 4.2, is what I use to get around Washington. And basically what it is, is it's a old three-wheeled scooter that um, I used to use in college and it had died out. And my dad got it running again. That's part of the reason why we call it the Phoenix. Um, and he built this sort of space age looking cockpit shell around it with uh, headlights and taillights and a fan and um, just all sorts of different switches and things and I, I, when I drive around it I'm pretty much completely covered and I'm uh, safe and away from the wind and, and rain and snow and uh, I've kind of developed a bit of a reputation on Capitol Hill um, because of it because I'm the only one in the world who has one because you know my dad built it for me. And it's really cool. Well thank you very much we happen to think so too. <laughs> Coming up, we'll hear how people with disabilities should never give up hope and strive to live a meaningful life. Look around you. Every day, heroes abound in our country. We're surrounded by people who courageously face difficult obstacles life has thrown in their paths. Tune in each week to meet people who show there are positive, godly solutions to tough, critical situations. We'll tackle challenging life issues such as abortion, stem cell research, adoption, and abstinence, and show that every human life is valuable and precious. Join us for inspiring stories of people facing life head on. Though Becca Hammond, John Seabold, and Aaron Welty may face some physical or mental challenges in life, it hasn't stopped them or their families from striving to make an impact on the people around them. I, I have a good friend. He once explained the relationship I have with the Phoenix as basically the Phoenix is Superman's cape. And it's the thing that gets everybody's attention. And um, then you get to stop and introduce yourself and tell them about what the Phoenix is. And then they'll start asking other questions, which leads you to kind of explain the backstory to my life in terms of um, just the pro-life angle and what it was like growing up and uh, just the wonderful Christian family that I got to grow up in. And How do you think it impacts them? You know, in, in more cases than not, I think the conversation gets to a point where it kind of gets them thinking in terms of, well, maybe these folks who have difficulty, you know, getting around, maybe the perception that I have 
of them and what their life is like isn't quite what it really is. I mean, because if you're able to get around in something like that um, and, and look like you're, you're mobile and you're able to um, just continue and, and have life be as you know, quote unquote normal as possible, it's like, well, maybe the perception that society has uh, for these kind of folks and the circumstances of how they came into the world and the things that they deal with, that their quality of life is actually possible and it's good. And, and I think that that serves, is able to serve as a good counterweight to the one of the prevailing pieces of wisdom in society right now that's erroneous that says the quality of life for these folks really isn't possible. So in more cases,